Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for um, our uh, event that's in our virtual series. It's uh, Upfront, uh, UM Experts, uh, Virtual Talks with UM Experts. And uh, my name is Scott Thompson. I work in the alumni office. And one of the uh, responsibilities I have, I do have the pleasure of working with the uh, School of Pharmacy as their alumni officer. And so uh, today I uh, actually know our speaker quite well. I served with Dr. Khan on uh, the executive council for the School of Pharmacy. And uh, Dr. Khan is the uh, director of the National Center for Natural Products uh, Research. And he's also a distinguished professor of pharmacognosy. Um, he has uh, many research interests. Uh, some of them include the evaluation and quality uh, and safety of dietary supplements. Uh, which we'll hear more about today, uh, microbial uh, transformation, fingerprinting and standardization of marker compounds and medicinal plant products, uh, among, like I said, many others. Um, Dr. Khan, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I, I read that you have been with our School of Pharmacy for almost 30 years, making it a better place. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I'm excited to hear uh, about dietary supplements today. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you and I do want to add one more thing. This is an interactive uh, event. If uh, you have any questions for Dr. Khan as, as we're going through uh, his talk, uh, you can post them in the chat or you can unmute your microphone and, and ask a question. But please, if you have any questions, um, we would love to uh, field those for you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to our own people. I mean, we go and travel all over the place, but uh, hardly get a chance to tell the story to our own people. So I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity. So before we go, as you see, my title is a myths and reality about dietary supplement. Those people who, who are not working in this area, they are confused. And those people who are working in this area, they are more confused. So this is something I'm gonna share. But before I go to in dietary supplement, I thought is there are a lot of myths about center itself because people know we do the center does a lot of research, uh, but is really not clear what goes on. So I thought take this opportunity to give an overview of what kind of activities we go because it's not one, it's not only diet supplement. So just a mission of the center when it was created, it was a partnership of university research organization, the federal government and pharmacy and agrochemical industries. And we have done very well when it's come to the government relationship and the university partnership, there's no doubt about it. Industrial approach is really the partnership is still lagging behind that we are working very hard to really develop on the industrial partners as good as we have the government partners. So we have FDA, USDA, NIH, uh, DOD, we have a lot of things going on in that one. We already have a federal government, as you know, the USDA, the Dr. Duke used to uh, direct uh, ARS branch here, now Charles Contrell is doing it. So we have the USDA presence itself, not only our partnership, but we have USDA folks uh, from ARS working on the natural product here in the building. So that's something uh, just to let you know. So in the center, we, have, we are part of the School of Pharmacy, as you all know, we have departments. Plus in the center, we are all full-time researchers. And we are close to 100 people. The beauty of this center is we are not divided into any compartment or department or specific areas uh, because of several reasons. One of the things is the funding situation, but we do have research faculties, postdoc, technical people. We have students working and undergraduate. And also we have a lot of visiting scientists coming from all over the world. So far, since we started the center, we have close to 300 research scientists and visiting scientists have been gone through our training here in the center. So we are very proud of, proud of it. And our fingerprints are all over the place globally. So these are the people I will tell you what they do. So first thing is when we started, remember I will be talking about IIT supplement with the start in 1994, but all the School of Pharmacy was engaged in the drug discovery. We had two missions, agrochemical and drug discovery. What I mean by that is trying to find a lead compound, a single molecule which can be used as a drug or the lead compound to develop a drug which is really has been contributed a lot into the pharmaceutical industry. 
and also focusing on agrochemical, going back to the nature and trying to find solutions for herbicides and pesticides uh, from the natural sources. All of our drug discovery effort that we have a lot going on, this is not only developing a drug, we have also the project look uh, for the mosquito repellent or killing mosquito, we have bed bugs. We now started a project for the fisheries to kill the snails uh, for the catfish pond. So there's a lot going on on the agriculture side and we are also engaging into more health of a human, not only human, also the animal health. So a lot goes on <clears throat> in collaboration with our USDA ARS scientists here and we are looking into agrochemicals. But we have long time project going on, drug discovery, antifungal, antibacterial, and many other effort, immune inflammation is all going on on drug discovery side that we do a lot of work in that area. And also depend on the funding situation and are the grants and we can always switch it. That's why we have people around, we have expertise uh, in molecular biology, toxicology, uh, chemists, of course, a lot of them, analytical chemists, the animal studies, and I will be showing about preclinical one. On the medicinal plant research, as you know, it's, it's everything goes on the medicine or non medicinal plants. So it can be a crop <clears throat> which can has been done in the past that we are trying to really develop a crop, alternative crop for Mississippi farmers that we can grow and has a better value. Also looking in the botanical human health, uh, and medicinal plants, and it depends whom we talk to. It can be traditional medicine, it can be dietary supplements, it can be local medicine. It has some plants which are traditionally ethno-pharmacologically used, and that's what we are focusing on. And that project actually has grown a lot because of our relationship with FDA. Uh, <clears throat> so when we look at the drug discovery, we Organism, but we have microorganisms, synthetic library, and we the, the idea is to develop a new drug or herbal product where we have a single molecule identified. So that effort goes on in that area for drug discovery, which I will say is still 60% of the people are involved in drug discovery aspects. Nature product, as you all know, if not 70% of the cancer drug use right now in pharma derived from the natural product. But overall, the natural product has contributed a lot, including antibiotics. And also now we have botanical drugs, the 40% of the product is anti is a natural product, natural botanical, natural ingredient, if you see it. Synthetic has been, but most of the synthetic has been coming from the lead from the natural products. So natural product has a lot to contribute in the area of drug discovery. When it's come to the medicine plant research, here we are not looking for a single molecule. We are looking as a whole extract, a plant, or whatever the way they consume is, uh, decoction. And But for that one, we really require a lot of different expertise, which we are proud to say we have all of them here in one place under one roof, which really make us very unique internationally. So we have botanists, we have medicine plant garden, we have agronomists, plant genomics, uh, because this is where your lab is. This is where you produce your material. And that, that's where we would like to really see uh, what's going on or how we can improve the crop. And also, can we grow it here in Mississippi or not? We have informatics, toxicology. So we have all the tools you need for drug discovery, plus all the tools you need to grow plant material and how to really identify a good quality plant material. So is all this inform information, as you can see, there's a lot more diverse expertise is needed. Plus we are lucky to have all the expertise available in the School of Pharmacy, like formulation, uh, if we need to or anything else. So we can always collaborate with them, which is really, we are a one big family. Uh, this is, uh, thanks to Don, this is a wonderful picture of the garden. We are lucky to have a new place. Uh, uh, if you are new, you don't know where we used to have. We used to have <laughs> a small garden with a hoop house, and now we have a wonderful garden. It is around four acre land, which is now we build another greenhouse. If you have a chance, you should visit us. We have greenhouses, and the beauty is it's not a big garden like New York Botanical Garden or Missouri Botanical Garden, but it has a niche uh, that all the plants grown there are medicinal values. Uh, have medicine values and they are 
if you want to have exotic plants which cannot grow in this environment, they are under the in the greenhouses. So this is very unique plants collection that we have, and we are proud to have that collection here. But if you want to just walk around, you can do also. We have made the walking path here, so people can go and walk. Uh, it's, it's a nice uh, place to do the research and also uh, see the value of medicine plants. Uh, for drug discovery, we became now a unique institution which has a repository. These are the plants which have no medicinal value per se, or we know that they have medicinal value, but this is the purpose of looking at the unknown plant material that we can go and do the screening and find some useful compound which can be developed as a lead compound. So we have around 50,000 samples over the years. Way back, this effort used to be funded by NIH, but no longer exists, but we know the value and we have continuously developing it. And now we have more than 50,000. We are still adding 1,000 to 2,000 sample a year and keeping the repository. So, I mean, it, that's the best place to start with the screening, which you already have in house. Uh, cannabis, you probably heard it. We are known it's going on under the leadership of Dr. Soli for 50 years. We are the good boys and bad boys. It depends how we look at it. This project is, is the longest running project uh, contract under NIH, uh, or NISA Drug, National Institute of Drug Abuse for <clears throat> 50 years. Uh, it's a lot of misconception about this project and people think we are growing whatever we wanna grow actually is a contract from NIH. They tell us what to grow and we have to grow under the strict conditions, uh, whatever the DEA license permit us. So this is very, uh, intense project, uh, it does serve the purpose. Our job is to produce the material that NIDA needs. And if you are writing an NIH proposal, you need a, any cannabis material, you don't have to worry about it, make a request to NIDA, NIDA asks us to do it and we provide to them. So all the research has been done in the US, uh, it's, the material has been provided by us. So we do play a critical role in that one. Not only that one, this is really not funded by anybody by, by default since we are growing plant material. Now we have a drug master file and we have a clinical trial going on. This is the only clinical trial except Epidiolex that is already approved that we have taken from cultivation all the way to the clinical testing which is going on in Jackson for children right now. So we are providing all the materials and clinical trial is happening. In Jackson, it's a very small trial because of the supply and formation and everything. Uh, but uh, chances are, and we hope uh, that is going to grow more. If you would like to know more about it, uh, Larry Walker will be the best person to talk about this clinical trial. And uh, Don, of course, is involved in almost everything. You know, everybody knows Don. Uh, we have a lot of misconception. Anytime you hear about any reference about cannabis, they just badmouth us that we are the one who is holding it. We have monopoly, which is not true. And anytime we try to respond, it's not true what you're saying. That's the way you see the cartoon. They try to just disregard it to make a point because honestly speaking, we are the only legal, federally legal place to grow marijuana and because of us, government has a place to provide legal marijuana, which people don't want that. So there's a lot of uh, backlash, we get it, but a lot of people who are really legally trying to do legal stuff, they appreciate that we provide that service to them. Uh, other project that uh, we are involved in, we are the core facility in the nation to look into the drug uh, induced liver injury network, which is NIH funded uh, project is a center several clinical or medical universities are involved and how we got involved in that one because uh, injury with because of diet supplement has really increased up to 20 percent it used to be only drug injury now we are seeing a lot of injury that people are coming by using the diet supplement and of course they can read through, i mean the label is cannot be trusted so they just don't know what is inside so we are doing all the work on this anytime patient gets in we get all the sample we analyze it uh, for the contamination and also what the label says. The other project is we have FDA Center of Excellence is going on for the last 20 years. This is a collaboration that has been developed just because FDA wanted to have some reliable sources of information that they can 
to rely on and make a decision. So the way the 2000 is started, it was, can we do the medicine plant garden is part of it. Can we provide the authentic sample? Can we do some chemistry analysis? Can we do identification? Because first thing is before you challenge anything in the bottle, you have to see where it's coming from. So it's coming from plant X, how the plant X looks like. So it's go back to the original thing and variation within the plant. So that's the work that we have started later on because of we do all these things, we add it into the safety. And we look into the liver toxicity, behavioral studies and drug interaction that I will be talking about. So these are the things that we have added on that side. Last four years, we have been involved in the cosmetics because this is a department in the FDA, they not the drug side cosmetics, the general cosmetics that everybody is using. Nowadays, you see that a lot of products claim to have all the natural products and all the cosmetics, it does wonderful things. And, but the more people are using it, there is more signals are coming of the allergic reaction. And they really, the basic thing is they don't know what is inside. So we are starting on that one. And we are collaborating now with Dr. Murthy in pharmaceutics, looking into skin penetration. So it is started with chemistry and now we are really getting to the bottom of it. So it does show in vitro assays that has been developed here in our center, which is licensed, the patented technique that we can really identify the, the the compound which can cause allergic reaction, but uh, what does it mean? So that's why we need a uh, collaboration with Dr. Murthy that we're looking into, into the real picture. Also to the service, we provide a lot of service to FD inspectors. So you know that uh, the FD inspectors are drug inspectors or the food inspector, but dietary supplement GMP started in 2008. 2010 was implemented. And for that one, we would like to know uh, the inspectors needs to be trained in dietary supplements. Of course, we were the natural match for them. So we started training and so far we have trained more than a thousand inspectors that have gone through our training here in the center. Uh, and we train them for how to look for dietary supplements because they are not pharma. They, they can be in any form in any, any shape. What are the major issues with that one? They have to look into that one. Plus we do, all this ICSP that I will be talking about a little bit more. Overall, this project has really blown into a lot of everything it goes around dietary supplements from identification to quality to safety and what is our role. And that's where I will be showing all the myths that is, we are dealing almost with everyone. Recently, we are proud to have to tell you that we have become NIH or at National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. Uh, integrity health. These are the three centers have been identified in the nation is a competitive uh, grant this is for five years. And that tells you that what has been developed. It started way 15 years ago with Dr. Pasco and Sir Dr. Pugh uh, that they started working on this uh, emulina or spirulina, <clears throat> which is blue green algae. And they try to see that there's a immuna enhancing properties for this one. And now after developing and generating all the data and information, the product was developed and being sold by Chromadex. Now we are trying to take that product to the humans and looking at the resiliency. Again, we are not trying to cure or finding anything antiviral, but does it helps your immune system that you can cope easily with your viral infection. And actually it was started with the flu because we didn't have a COVID that time. And so it is still very relevant for us whether the concept that people, when they take it, some botanicals, can they really have a response or give immune boost to your body the way you can cope with the viral infection. And we are moving in that direction. And that's also a collaboration. There are two projects. One is pharmaceutics and when Dr. Uh, Dr. Shirley Tan and also Dr. Galen Marshall, uh, who is in Jackson Medical School in uh, Medical College. So this is the first time we have a joint grant as a center grant with the medical center. And uh, I think this collaboration has a lot of potential to grow in many directions. Uh, we will be talking about herb drug interaction. As you know, a lot of people not only taking the medicine, or some people are taking regular medicine for diabetes or for heart uh, for cholesterol, but there is a potential with the drug interaction. And this is, we got just funded a, a grant 
Dr. Bilgerli and Shavana Khan are the PIs on that one looking into drug interaction. Uh, we have a clinical facility because we do all the thing growing from plant material all the way to, instead of going to animals, what thought is, okay, let's do the, the safety profile of this thing. So we develop this clinical unit here. Uh, this is again, this is volunteers. Uh, it's not a, they are healthy, they are not sick people, otherwise they have to go to Jackson. So the trial is more of a PK studies that we can do it here, look at the efficacy and with us, uh, their safety. And if it is safe, and then we can go and look into the trial in Jackson or somewhere else where we can find a partner. But this is very unique facility in the School of Pharmacy that you can see we have done one project for Department of Defense looking for anti-malarial uh, compound, which Dr. Walker was a lead on it. Not only looking at the research side, we are also pay attention to the, uh, the education component. So that was a partnership with the manufacturer or the vendors of making instrument for analysis waters. And so they provided all the hardware and our people provided all the expertise. And this lab has been established for the training people because you remember not, nobody, uh, no school is teaching this nature product uh, aspects or dietary supplements in any school that I know. So the people can be trained for a short period of time and they can do their own analysis. So we're providing that service to anybody who's interested in. We are also partnering with the American Botanical Council and American Albert Pharmacopoeia. <clears throat> this is more information dissemination and trying to find the right science-based information that can be put to use. And this is all, most of the industries are is sponsoring it. Our role is to provide the scientific evidence and the document, scientifically valid document for them to look at it. So we are involved with that one. Uh, anytime we do anything, which generally we are ha happen to be the first one, if we say this not there or it's not right, we end up into the, the media or even Congress, people talk about it because we are the only one who created this, uh, showed them the results and we get dragged into the court cases on a regular basis. This is a conference that I think the Oxford should be proud of. This is going on for 20 years. And as this is, we bring around 300 or more people to the Oxford International Conference. Now you can see it's sponsored and supported. Actually, it was part of our FDA grant where they wanted to have some workshop to disseminate information. It became an international conference. This is, we do not talk about the product, uh, which product is good rather than we talk about what are the regulations and what are the signs, how science can help and how science can help the industry also. So this, this is the event which we did not have last year, hoping to, hoping that is gonna happen next year, is still keeping the finger crossed. Having said that, this is the background. Now you know why we are going to talk about the myths and promises because we are pretty much involved in all aspect of it. So dietary supplement, as you know, first of all, there's a myth number one is, what are the dietary supplements? How they are regulated? Who regulates them? What, what are the claims people make it? So first thing is, what are the main issues that people are concerned about is, uh, to, the way I define is, <clears throat> safety is a very, imp very important thing. And that's where the FDA comes in for dietary supplement because dietary supplements are not checked, approved by the approved by the FDA up front, what FDA wants is to make sure at least they are safe to start with. Efficacy, if they're efficacious is good, but the safety also plant growing outside, they have a lot of biological contamination. If they are growing molds on it, it can be aflatoxins, heavy metal and pesticide because this plant's grown is a small crop, it really has a value. So they're trying to protect it with pesticide, herbicide, whatever they can do it. And what it does, it end up in your product and also the chemicals. Some plants are traditionally used, which are, have toxic effect. And so there is inherent pro uh, problem with these plants that we have to be careful about. The other thing is every preparation is different. Nothing is defined, it's not Tylenol that you see. It doesn't matter what brand you take it, you still have the same amount. Uh, how to standardize it, how, what to expect in that one. And since there's not many plants which has active component in it, people just go with the compound XYZ that really represent that plant. 
and that molecule can be present in many things. But again, they have something to measure. So say they got X amount and adulteration and misidentification is another one that it can be anything if it is not what it's supposed to be. And efficacy, we assume they are efficacious. And as I said, efficacy is a different aspects of the thing that do require a lot of evidence, which really is lacking a lot in this area. Now, when it's come to the traditional knowledge, uh, the best example is a Fedra, Mahwang, that is being used as a dietary supplement. There was a lot of cases that even athletes were dropped in the field. And uh, so we had ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, both came from a Fedra plant, Chinese plant, and if you see it, both are pharmaceutical. Ephedrine is used with pseudoephedrine, is behind the counter now because we started making methamphetamine out of it. So it's nothing to do with a Fedra plant, it is still used in Chinese medicine. It does have a, a properties which help you to uh, uh, ease your bronchial conditions. Also, dietary supplement is not before 1994. I mean, the fish oil was known, so is known, folic acid is known. So they are added to your diet because of the deficiency, but this is never defined as a dietary supplement. They were there. Now, probiotic is another area. People used to take vinegar or yogurt. Now we have hundreds of products out there, and which is really a debate to which one is a good one. So let's start now. When it's come to the myth number one, supplements are regulated like drugs, are supplement approved by FDA, or if it depends whom you talk to, they say supplements are not regulated. So it depends whom you talk to, and the truth is in between. So what is a dietary supplement? Is it started in 1994? That was Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was passed in 1994, which defined dietary supplements is intended to supplement the diet. Uh, just to give the historic background to why we came up with the Dietary Supplement uh, Act, because people would wanted to have access to all the medicinal plants, or traditional medicine plant, which are already consumed. And the debate was, they are gonna go as a drug. It means it's gonna, everything has to be proven and approved by the FDA before they can use it. And it cannot be done. And it's gonna take a long time. People don't have access to it, which is a useful thing. It's traditionally used all over the world. So it should be accessible. So if it is not a drug, which they don't want FDA to approve as a drug, he said, how we are gonna have access to it. So now they combine with the vitamins and minerals and there's a lot of things went in the lobbying with the industry and uh, pharma and vitamin industry and everything else. So that's, that was a compromise we came. So the thing is diet is supplement is supplement your diet and is intended to take as a pill. So if it is not a pill, you put on your uh, skin, is not a dietary supplement. If you take a suppository, it's not a dietary supplement. If you take an injection, it's not a dietary supplement. It has to be taken by mouth. So that's the first criteria of that. So we had a food, we still have, and drug, and dietary supplement, they created a separate GMP, is a kind of in between. It's more than the food. Food is generally, you look at it, you smell it, but dietary supplement require more identification and drug of course is required more uh, contamination and all the whole profile. So dietary supplement regulations are in between. The main difference is, and that's very key, that drug manufacturer, they can make diagnose, cure, mitigate, but dietary supplement should not make any claim to do any of these things, should not diagnose, mitigate, or prevent, or treat. As soon as you say that, you are getting out of the category and you are getting into drug, which is a lot of things people were trying to do, not write on the label, but put a flyer with it or have information on the side. And the reason they do it, because that's not controlled by FDA. All the inform information part belongs to FTC, Federal Trade Commission. So they take care of that claim. So there are two government agencies are working it. So they look at the part of what information you're providing and FDA does about this claim. So these are the thing that if it is not on the bottle, then it's not FDA. It's, I mean, FDA can go in, but they generally work with the FTC together to, to deal with the situation. Uh, anything which was not used before 1994, there's a lot of products and ingredient has been included in dietary supplements, which is causing a lot of problem that you have to file the new dietary ingredient 
and you have to send it to FDA. If FDA has a problem, they will let you know, otherwise they won't. They do not approve or disapprove. They look at your application, and if they have objection, they will tell you that, yeah, this information is missing, but they will never say it has been approved. That's another misconception out there. On the, on the other hand, when they, they thought about the serious people who want to really develop as a drug, which can be reimbursed by insurance, they had cre FDA has created a guidance for industry to come up with the drug, botanical drug, which required approval from FDA, but it does not require all this, uh, like a phase one, phase two, phase three trial approach because they are lenient, it depends what information you have and they can allow you and it's a guideline so it's already there. So far they have approved two is a green tea extract, which is extract is not a pure compound. And they are not looking as for your single molecule activity rather than the whole extract. And this is another one was pro, uh, approved for diarrhea for AIDS patients. And now we have epidiolex which is cannabinoid. So in order to summarize this, this is a good slice to what our FDA is like, God to reward you based on your intention. Our FDA regulates you based on your intention. So it's one thing can be, it really depends what the application is and it will be in different form and shape. So that's where the confusion comes in because everything is looked at differently and regulated differently. If you're taking by mouth and you're supplementing your diet is good, but if you say it's gonna cure your heart problem, then is going to go into the drug form. So now let's go to the myth. It has been used for thousands of years, so it must work. And this is common, I mean, makes sense. But what is the relevancy? In what context is applicable? That's something needs to be looked at it. So first thing I will give you, I have plenty of examples, but I thought this will be very interesting. Uh, way back, they started the first after ephedra was banned because people were dying because of ephedrine and combination with caffeine, this plant was introduced, it's called Hoodia gordonii. It's not a cactus, it's a cactus-like plant, it's slow growing. It grows in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia. And this plant, what, how it came to the CSIR and the, the research council in South Africa was looking at in animal studies and they found that animal were losing weight and they went back and tried to find out. So this is the Kalahari Desert where the Bushmen, they go for hunting trip uh, for two, three days. They have no, nothing to eat. They are going for hunting and the water is scarce over there. So they take the sap of this Hoodia cactus plant, which really not make them hungry and thirsty. And that's, that's a tradition knowledge of that one. Just remember, they have nothing to eat over there. They are taking their sap, it works for them. And look at it, they, I don't think they need for the weight loss. Now, this thing came, uh, BBC has a, a story on it and that's where it's picked up everything. So it means we got a drug, or we got something traditionally based that it can work after eating two, three pizzas and Big Mac that you can use that Hoodia capsule. And suddenly, every, Hoodia was everywhere. So Hoodia became weight loss product, and there was it went so fast. So and as I said, it's slow growing plant material that this plant material became endangered, and you can't grow fast enough. So people they started the market was growing, and there is news article everywhere. So look at this one is Hoodia review. And what you want to know about Hoodia? So it's a very interesting article when you read it how Hoodia works, and then you will see in the bottom of something that I can probably make it bigger for you to see. There's not much public research on Hoodia. So this is actually the fact. But it became in the market, it became the top selling a billion dollar industry right away. Uh, we know a lot of diet things are going on, the body wraps and diet pills and kind of thing, but Hoodia started doing their own products based on Hoodia. And one was very interesting. They have the Hoodia lipstick. Uh, so I don't, if you lick your lips and probably lose your weight. So, I mean, the people who are really taking this thing about Kalahari Desert, people who are using it works for them and how we convert it into this dietary supplement lip lipstick. So that's, that's the myth. It does not mean that you have to be in that context and you have to make it relevant to understand 
how it's used, as I showed you, ephedra and hoodie. Now, supplement always contain what their label says. So we know a lot about it. And if you look at, again, the food here, the product we analyze, and we analyze 150, uh, one sample and look at it. We did the tea bag, the capsule, liquid gel, juice, you name it. And there's a lot of products were endorsed by uh, celebrities too. But so this is all variation of the product and you say how many negative and positive we got it. There's only 37 product which has some in it. Okay, it's not really, and we don't know what is active in it. The thing is one compound P57 was active and there was nothing in that one. And a lot of products have nothing in it. And generally they are very expensive. For analysis, we end up buying all of them and not end up using it because we see that's nothing in there anyway. And the reason was that people, if you go to Kroger or Walmart, you will see this open shelf, uh, this cactus leaves that people are using as a food. They started mixing it, which is a food. It doesn't kill you. And that's, you can make a product. You still have something cactus-like a cactus in it. And so there were substitution is happening because of that one. Green tea, which everybody knows it, is a green tea, you take a tea bag, but when it's go to the product and it's being used for weight loss, bodybuilding, everything, and look at the composition of green tea. So green tea, if you take a capsule, what is in there? It's from none to high amount, it can be very different. And the next slide will show you, look at this claimed amount for caffeine, which they add. Uh, they are not claiming any, but you can get into the 200, 30 milligram of caffeine. The things we claim is supposed to be component of catechins in 150 milligram you don't detect. So if these composition components are not there in green tea, it's not a green tea, they are adding just a caffeine in it. Okay, or coffee, tea, but it's not a green tea at all, which it was very surprising to me at that time, not anymore that I mean green tea is supposed to be green tea, but it's not the case. Uh, product like aloe vera, uh, uh, which is gel, is used everywhere. And it's a billion dollar industry. There's a big consortium working on it. Uh, again, the demand and supply and the cost. And there's a lot of products out there which are putting maltodextrin, which is a gel, can be created as a gel and in aloe vera product. So now it tells you what product says on the label. It does not mean that it's supposed to be there. Now you see the headlines, some of them is done because of our results, some or other people have done it. Brain boosting, which is going on right now, we just had a publication out of it. A human being, which is used as a herbal Viagra, uh, it causes a problem. <clears throat> uh, high doses, some of the myths are about the safety. Supplements never interact with drugs, which is not true. The best example was uh, St. John's Wort, which made the headlines that time. St. John's Wort is a very popular mild sedative, uh, works for the mild uh, depression, and it's traditionally used. It's a very useful product, but they saw this as a drug interaction when they were doing clinical trial. And since then, we are looking all aspects of the safety also for dietary supplement because people are consuming it. And that was especially the birth control pill. You should not be taking high frequency. Hyperigamal St. John's word is, is written on the bottle now. Uh, another one which is very popular is the red, red rice uh, because it has the same component, levastatin, a monoclonal K, uh, and it works, of course, it does have a small amount in it, but it's the same molecule which is you're gonna use in the drug as a levastatin. So the problem is, yes, you can take the red rice, which is gonna give you the small amount, but those people are in, having interaction with that one, a problem. It can be a problem for them. Plus you look on the right side, we small, but uh, there's no consistencies or any of the products. So you sometimes you will end up having uh, as much as is recommended in the drug as is, and you are thinking you're not taking a drug. So that's, that's a risky part on that one. This is some of the results that we have published. Some, the, most of the things have been done here in the center. And we're continuously looking for, now we have NIH grant, but also for every project, we are looking into hub drug interaction. Uh, natural is safe and natural is better. 
uh, that's not true. I mean, if you look at all the poisons meant to mankind, they came from the nature. Uh, it's not true the nature is uh, safe. Uh, it can be safer. So I'm talking about dealing that we are working as a core facility for them. These are the clinical centers that we are really collecting all the products and they send a sample to us. And uh, it's no telling. Some people are coming with one product and some people bring the 40 product because they are taking, you name it, they are into it, they buy all the products they have consumed for a couple of months. And the product can be one ingredient, it can be 20, or it can be 50. Now, Bharti Ahula in our lab is, and Tien Hong are doing a wonderful job to really identify it. Now we have developed a database and now we are faster to look at all these things is reported in our products and we analyze them not only for that one, we also look for contamination for steroids, pharmaceuticals, and all the other contamination pesticides, because it can be causing the problem. And we, we have shown that some of the thing that they were puzzling why they are showing it, it because of the steroids, or it was because of the pharmaceutical was included in that one. So it does not mean that all the natural stuff is safe. Uh, and the other one is the DMA, which is we went on behalf of FD to say that it's not natural. People made it up and they think this a DMA is a natural compound, which is not. They banned it, but they put it into another product. It caused 29 liver cases, most of them the service men and women, young in Hawaii, and that became a very popular case. And this product is actually in my opinion, they are nat not natural. It's kind of a cocktail. The thing is all like caffeine, you mean you mix single ingredient, which by definition you can do it. And they come up with a very powerful cocktail which can go either way. It might work or it can cause a problem too. Now more supplementation is always better. That's not true either. And there's a, there's a lot of cases going on with even green tea. Uh, there's a lot of people who are really into weight loss. They are dieting, they are taking very high amount of green tea and they have a liver injury. And it's not conclusive, but all the data that has been published and shown that yes, it does cause a problem. And uh, the problem with this uh, liver injury, you cannot go retrospective and do a study again and type this. But uh, these are the things that yes, it's not that taking anything supplement for in moderation People drink tea, billions of people do it, nothing happens. But if you take very large amount, it can cause a problem. Side effect of cinnamon, you remember people were sniffing or taking two kilogram, but two spoon of uh, the cinnamon to lower their blood sugar and they have a problem too. And there's a lot of many other examples you see all the time. Uh, this is the, for right now is very hot topic for, they call it nootropics uh, for your brain. And that was product is developed in China is a traditional herbal medicine called Hooperzia and the active compound is Huperzine. <clears throat> and they are looking at for Alzheimer's disease, actually it's a cognitive, it has been, the drug has been developed by China and they, ha they have a limited amount how much you can do because it's a drug, it's a botanical drug there. So they came up with that one. But when we analyze the product here, you have a product uh, like this one, 78 and 79, it gives you the full amount of what is recommended as a drug. Okay, now you have a natural product which is causing a problem. You have some, some example which is really not, if you look into the uh, 72, it does have a huperazine but nothing else. So it means they are putting a single molecule. It has nothing to do with botanical. And the rest of the products you see that they have almost nothing in it. So the, you are assuming you're gonna get it, but you're not getting it. So this is the biggest challenge, which one you would like to have it, which one is right, and is very difficult without getting the analysis done. Hey, Dr. So, Dr. Khan, um, yeah. you have, uh, can, can we uh, take a break for a couple of questions? Uh, I'm almost done. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll wait till then. Okay, uh, supplements always do what they say they do. Uh, like sleep and lose weight. Uh, I don't know whether it does. Uh, brain power, brain power, I don't know, it's health. 
but I could not find a better slides to do for the manpower. So here is a cartoon that there's a lot of product from manpower is being used in the market right now. <clears throat> uh, we are aware of weight loss is one of the category diabetes is another one that people are really being ripped off. And the last one I wanna show you because it requires a separate lecture on it is marijuana. CBD does everything. On the right side, it has all the question about CBD. What do we know about CBD? We know a lot about THC. We know their abuse of it. We know the addiction of it, CBDs. Now some people looking for the signs, FD would like to have signs. Some people think about there's nothing in there and some people think it cures everything. So that tells you the whole thing about it. Now, the last one is all supplement marketing claims are uh, tested and backed by science. I think I will let you answer that question, that myth. I have given you enough information before I say anything. I wanna leave with a positive note. Doesn't matter what, what I told you right now, I showed you this is the real problem, they exist, they need to be taken care. But nature product do have a uh, role to play in human health. The more we are going with uh, health maintenance rather than curing diseases, prevention, natural product, diet, nutrition, it has a role to play. So, but education is a component, knowing what it is, uh, what we are taking for, what it says, whether it's true or not, that we have to be really educated about. It. Now, I will add with this quotation, which really fits very well. There are known unknowns, and that's very true. And so this definition of from swell is fit very well. We know, we know, we don't know what we don't know. And that's to summarize whole diet supplement situation. Even though we are working last 25 years on this area, it's still there are a lot of things which are known to. We know this needs to be done, but has not been done. With that one, I would like to stop and thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take any question. Um, I've had a few that have come in over chat, but someone has asked if they can um, unmute and uh, uh, personally ask you a question. So uh, if we can go to that one first. All right. Go ahead. Oh, uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Dr. Khan, and I'm a the pharmacy student from India, and my question is, and most of these people are taking uh, nutraceuticals and herbal tablets, like they they don't get any protein, that means multivitamins, and they don't even get from food, and they are taking like a like normal tablets, like and how they are going, how the tablets are going to affect their health, and most of the doctors in India say that they are not useful, and even you can get the multivitamins from your food. Okay, so I mean, if you believe in it, and I mean, there are some vitamins certainly required. It depends on the stages. Uh, for, uh, if you are suffering with some disease, you generally end up with disbalance of your vitamins and minerals. Uh, if you are having a healthy diet, and honestly speaking, if you can afford $80 bottle of a supplement, I'm sure you are, you are in good shape to have a good nutritional diet if you pay attention to your diet. So. From that point of view, not everybody needs a supplement, uh, but uh, there are supplement, again, is a supplement. So if, as I showed you, <clears throat> if you are having a diet to reach, that is gonna make, make you gain weight and still you are taking a supplement to lose your weight, it's just not gonna work. So I think is a, to me is applying a common sense uh, in your situation will be the best way to do it. So if you take a green tea, I um, mean, you drink a tea is fine, but if you're taking a couple of capsules to lose weight, uh, it just, you're gonna hurt yourself in long term. So I mean, this, with the doctor saying right or doctor saying is wrong, it's very difficult for me to judge it. In general, as I said, it, if you are well off, you can, if you pay attention to your diet, uh, you probably will be better off. Uh, those people who really can't afford medicine or supplement or don't have a good diet, as you know, it's all over the place that people are trying to provide vitamin rich diet to these people who are really hungry and can't have something to eat. That really they need supplemental things, whether it's a milk 
where is flour uh, uh, put it more vitamins and minerals in it so yeah that makes sense so I, I really don't know what situation if you have a particular situation i can be more specific but i gave you all the information that you have to judge yourself whether this supplement is going to work on the other hand if you believe in it strongly and it's helping you doesn't matter what is inside the bottle as long as it's not killing you uh, if you feel is working and is working then it's working hi dr khan i i'm going to take you all the way back to probably about 1992 1990 and under the lead solely you all were working on a project sponsored through Bristol Myers uh, project and I was the people's department then. We called it RIPS, Research Institute for Pharmaceutical Sciences. And so I had to leave before the end of the project and I never did hear the results. <laughs> Can you uh, remember back that far and find out what uh, was the conclusion on Texol and its uh, cure for ovarian cancer? Yes, thanks for asking. Uh, that's all. That's where I started my career here. So uh, we the, we had a Bristol Myers project that she's referring to. That was, if you remember, the Texol became potential or uh, candidate to develop. And there was that time there there was no medicine available for ovarian cancer. So that it got a special status. It was a natural compound which has activity in vitro and animal that can be really tested in human. And so FDA gave go ahead because it was in already public domain. So there was no patent that people can use it. So they got a special permission to develop. Bristol Myers got uh, that permission. So they were looking for supply issue. The tax all come from the bark from yew tree and you can just can't chop the trees and bark. So they were looking for the different sources. So we got a project that Dr. McShesi was director of the Research Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences and the project was for us to grow uh, Texas plant, which that's what we had at that time in the hoop houses. We had a couple of hundred plants that we were looking in the, on the needles or the leaves of the Texas plant. So we were looking and uh, trying to optimize the concentration of this Texol and get a better yield. So that was a project that Bristol Meyer was looking end of the day when we, we optimize the yield, we used to do 20 kilogram extraction of plant material every day to look at the yield content, which I did. But uh, they, they found all the information, but end, end of the day, the Bristol Meyer decided just getting a pure compound from the needles is just not going to be enough for them. So they came up with taking a molecule we call Becatin uh, one of the precursor and putting a side chain. So that's the final product. But yeah, Texol was approved as a drug. It helped a lot of people as they were ovarian cancer. After that, there's a whole series of, they call Texotier. They have other Texol derivatives, which have been uh, gone into cephalomanin has been converted. So there's a lot of other products has been introduced in the market from different countries. The Texotier coming from France. So they, they have, so Texol was became the latest, so far the latest anti-cancer drug is a Texol, which came from the uh, from the plant materials, and we were part of the co contributing factor to the science on the Texol project in that time. Not only that one, if you're looking at the history, the very first one that we contributed to, it was heart heartemisinin, which was done by Dr. Ed Groom and Dr. McChesney, Dr. Al-Soli, and Dr. Halal Soli. Uh, they provided kilogram of material artemisinin for WHO clinical trial for uh, human when the WHO decided to do cl first clinical trial in human. And RIPS is the one who provided all the material for clinical uh, trials. So we do have a long history of contributing to the single molecule. And that's, that's why Dr. Meshesh was able to make a case to create a new natural product center, uh, which can be a partnership with industry and government together to focus on natural product because we had long history of uh, natural products and contribution in that area. I hope that answered your question. 
Yes, you did answer my question. And I'm pleased to hear that uh, the project that I actually helped work on um, was, was somewhat beneficial. Um, Barbara Howard uh, was my name then, and I am a graduate of, of, of the University of Mississippi um, two times. And so I'm very pleased with the work that you all are doing in this, in this realm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Khan, my name is Anand Sridhar. I was a graduate from uh, the medicinal chemistry department a few years ago from John Romaldi's lab. Uh, it's nice to see you uh, after a very long time. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I have just two questions. I'm currently a faculty member at the at MCPHS University in Boston as an associate professor in medicinal chemistry. So one part of my question deals with uh, over the last 20, 25 years with the change in the PharmD curriculum, the role of pharmacognosy as a discipline in pharmacy has pretty much diminished. There are very few schools that still offer pharmacognosy as even as a master's uh, track project. Uh, my question to you is when we are educating PharmD students who go on to become clinical pharmacists, uh, retail pharmacists and so on, what can we as faculty members do in terms of educating our students so that they can educate the consumer? Uh yeah, we have done an article way back with the, uh, and tried to see the knowledge of, uh, and that was actually on hypericum, what pharmacists knew in 90s, early stages of that one. And it was amazing. Some of them, they said how hypericum works because it's protect, it coated your nerve system. So that's why it protects it. Uh, the knowledge, pharmacies are also on the forefront of it. I have been to pharmacies myself and ask pharmacists about the product and they read me the label because a school of pharmacy we have here for PharmD students, elective program that we are doing it. There's pretty much a self-education. I don't think any, even though in medical schools they have made it herbal medicine as a part of the curriculum. I don't think that it has been done in the school of pharmacies. I think is at least Pharmacists should be aware of it. And this is a question I pose to pharmacy organizations, especially the retail one is, uh, if I'm buying a product from gas station and buying from pharmacy, what, how they are different. So I think the pharmacy as a whole, as a profession, plus also the pharmacies, everybody has to look into that one because this is the, not even knowing about the product, what it does, but at least having the product they're reliable, they're safe, they're efficacious, and pharmacists can say, okay, don't take, take ginkgo, don't take ginseng, this is your problem. I don't think that has been fully, it has been introduced as a voluntary uh, elective courses, but it's, it's not has been part of the curriculum. Honestly speaking, the way is going, sooner or later it has to happen and it will happen. Uh, people are talking about creating courses that we are even thinking about it. Uh, pharmacognosy, the way we were doing, like Taxol or artemisinin, I don't think it's going to come in that form and shape. Correct. It's going to be changing pharmacognosy itself because we were, uh, the last 50, 60 years, we have been reductionist. We look at the molecule only. Uh, that has to change. Now we have to look at the whole composition because the dietary supplements is really crossing the border of nutrition and food and everything else. So you can buy a juice, which is not a supplement, it's a food, but it's still you are putting antioxidant in it. So having a general knowledge for the consumer and the pharmacist, in my opinion, is in the forefront. I don't think the pharmacies are there. I don't think they have, even they can, I mean, they can read the label or look into the information, but they don't have their own expertise that they can guide you. Uh, safe, same thing, I mean, as a pharmacist, you can look at the drug, I mean, they general, they have to look at for drug interaction. For dietary supplement, I mean, there's no database available. So that, that's the thing that all the school of pharmacy, you raise the right question. I mean, there's a, education is a big component that needs to be handled and it has to come uh, to the forefront because we are moving from drug, we are moving from food, we are coming in the area, which is a $40 billion industry right now that really need some educated people and education in that area. Market just cannot sustain uh, unsubstantiated forever. So who's gonna fill that role? We are trying our best and we are thinking about it, thinking about some course in that area. 
let's see how it goes. But you raised the right question. Pharmacognosy is, I mean, we don't have, in US, we don't, nobody has a pharmacognosy department anymore, but we do have at least division of pharmacognosy. And Chicago has one, the rest of the people don't have pharmacognosy in the nation, which used to be pharmacognosy department. Right. Uh, one other question, sir, which relates to, uh, you showed a few pictures where uh, the center right now is becoming a repository of a lot of extracts and, uh, and uh, really a lot of data. Do you think in the in the foreseeable future, in the next, let's say, five years or so, that the center will be able to have something like a fingerprint database? So when uh, when we come across, um, let's say, a, a, a bottle of Hoodia, Gordon Eye in a gas station, and we are concerned as the average consumer, but an educated consumer, that we can bring, you know, send it in, uh, you can check with a fingerprint and say, okay, this is basically clean or this is not standardized or this is actually from, uh, you know, you have actually a drug additive, anything like that in terms of detection? Uh, yes, yes, we are doing it. Uh, so right now we are working with three organizations with FDA, they have, we look at the general molecules or FDA does their regulatory science in their place. So we don't, we are not part of regulation. We are analyzing all the sample for dealing that they are collecting as a part of the project. We are also working with, with the University of Health Sciences in Maryland, which is really the Army Medical School. And all the Marines and the servicemen and women are taking, pumping up a lot more dietary supplements, which are more contaminated or laced with the drugs than any product available to general public. And we are working on that one. We get a lot of samples from both case studies we have from medical schools, we analyze it. We do our own analysis that, I mean, you can send it to Bharti, she will be happy to analyze. The only thing we are trying to be careful here because anybody has a liver injury or any case for dietary supplement, they wanna send us and we can do the analysis. But with that one, we have to go and become a witness and uh, we, we get like subpoena and we, we don't have time for all these things. So we generally forward that request to somebody else but if people are not trying to really make a lawsuit or taking us to the court with our analysis, I think we, we generally do it and we do it for, I just mentioned the major, the dealing thing, but the word is out. We get a lot of products from medical school. Recently, we paper has been submitted. People are taking antiviral drug supplement and they have a big drug interaction. These are HIV people, HIV drugs and we are publishing it. So yes, we have developed, uh, uh, Bharti don't mind if I give the number, but we have 15,000 compounds that we can screen right now from natural sources. Wow. And we do the negative screening for pharmaceuticals. Uh, we do for all the steroids. So the more we are learning it, in the beginning, it was very difficult. You have 40 names on the bottle and you have to look for 40 ingredients. Now we have done that many, many times. So. We, we are in a very good shape. The problem is if you are talking about product analysis for contamination, it's a lot easier to do it if you're looking for a particular pharmaceuticals. But what is the chances of your product will be the same as ours because diet supplement, things are not defined. Mm -hmm. So the product we analyze, we can do it. So the way we are trying to create our database is not based on the product rather than individual plant material. So if you say Hoodia, we can say it as who do you not, we are looking at the fingerprint for that. So we are not only for LC aspect, we are also trying to develop by animals. So uh, hopefully we will have the database. Uh, I mean, we do have in-house, but sooner or later we can release it if people want to. Yeah, essentially a voucher specimen when in back in the day when we would do isolation, you would have to identify your plant location, submit a voucher specimen. And I'm, I'm hoping that that would be something that would be available uh, and the center is probably excellently placed. Having been a student there and having seen what's done, uh, it's still a, a very proud thing for me to see what's happening there. Uh, I'll, that's really a quick incident. So when I was presenting to uh, a group of pharmacists for a CE event that asked me to talk about uh, cannabis when it was coming in New York. And I told them the story of how I would drive down Highway 6 towards Batesville. And in the, in the, the late evening around 9, 10 o'clock, I could just roll my window down and take a deep breath and still claim I did not inhale. 
uh, because the, the 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 plant garden was down by six. I don't know where it is now, but it's it's nice to see all the work that's being done. Um, I'm really uh, I was glad to see the op the uh, link pop up on Dr. David Allen's uh, LinkedIn page, so I was able to get in really quickly. Uh, Mr. Thompson, thank you for letting me ask my questions. And Dr. Khan, once again, uh, it's nice to see you, to see you virtually, yeah. and thank you very much for answering my questions. You all the best. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Khan, um, came in over Hello? the chat. Uh, was asked about do vitamins interact with prescriptions? Uh, vitamins. This is a more of a pharmacist question than my question. I certain vitamins I will say will do, but I cannot tell you which vitamin is going to interact with that because a vitamin generally are regarded as safe, but again, and some vitamins are like vitamin C is used all the time with the Tylenol and aspirin, everything else. Uh, but I, I have to look at particular vitamin and look into the, also the amount, how much amount you are taking. So if you are taking the excessive amount of particular vitamin, I will be, I have to check on whether it does have interaction. But if you're taking a multivitamin a day, a small dose to daily recommended dose, I don't think we have to worry about it. Another one came in about um, claims that dietary supplements make, and um, are there any controls to prevent unproven claims? Uh, claims will not be written in the bottle, so FDA, no, FDA will not do anything about it. The claims generally are written somewhere else. <clears throat> that FTC is going, I mean, right now the FDA has gone after several companies who are making the COVID claims uh, on their web pages and other materials. So now they are going deep into it, not only the label one. Uh, the thing is there are hundreds and thousands of product out there. Uh, the manpower FD has, they can't go for each and every product. So generally they go with harm the people first. So for example, if they have a choice to go for weight loss product right now and the COVID one, they will go for COVID one. So that's the way they look at it. And some of the one that, okay, it's okay there. It's not gonna hurt people. So that's based on the resources, but I mean, there is no shortage of it. I mean, uh, buying from Amazon, I mean, this, that, that's something, I mean, we have a lot of experiences buying stuff. We buy from the companies the stuff that they don't send it to us. Uh, luckily, I don't wanna announce on the on internet, but. Luckily, they don't know the Oxford is university town. <laughs> so if you give the home address, you get the product. But if you say university, you don't get the product. So. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes, Dr. Khan. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. My question is related with the adulterations. Right? Yes. Yeah, actually, now I want to know how can we confirm about uh, any herbal products? It may be botanical extracts or the final products. You can say medicines. It comes from the non-GMO or the GMO. So, I mean, that's what I showed you. That's what we do. We confirm it. It's going to require a lot more analysis for you. The problem is if you have a plant material that you can look at it, which generally traditionally is being done for the people who are practicing it, they can smell it, they can look at it. Uh, but right now, everything is powder, mix, extract. Uh, if you had no other way than doing the chemical analysis, that's the only way you can find out. But uh, uh, chemical did not uh, give the right uh, idea about the GMO and the non-GMO. Yes, you can do the DNA analysis for that one, which we are also doing DNA identification. You can use the molecular techniques for that. So, so far, as far as I know, for dietary supplement, if you're talking about traditional medicine, there is no issue GMO or non-GMO right now, unless you are using like soy or wheat or something, main crops. Dietary supplement, 
their supply issue, their cultivation, uh, the varieties has been not developed in a way that GMO and non-GMO issue is coming. People are using as a marketing tool right now, honestly speaking. I have not seen any, any crop which has been developed or modified to be called GMO, uh, unless the major crops uh, that you're talking about. So I don't think if somebody say my product is a non-GMO or, I mean, this is a marketing ploy, like people say natural, uh, flour and I, I don't know what it means. Is it supposed to be natural anyway? Uh, like if you buy the Tabasco, it says zero calories. I mean, I don't know who wants to eat Tabasco for calories. So it's all marketing thing. So, I mean, these are the thing that is nothing. I won't worry about a GMO right now, but there are molecule tools that we are using for identification. As a DNA marker, you can do that. And it has been done for maize and corn and other major crops, but I don't think for dietary supplement that I know, even in the major one like green tea, ginseng, there's no GMO involved right now in the, any of the crop. And same thing, uh, Dr. Khan uh, means uh, like suppose uh, in me is uh, curcuminoid, yeah. curcuminoid from curcuma longa. So some adulteration of the synthetic curcumin is going on. So, and there are so many products natural products in which the synthetic uh, compounds are mixed. So how we will confirm that it is uh, natural or it comes from the synthetics way? Yeah, there are Same thing, it is, comes, it is a part of adulteration. So how will in the natural products, uh, so yeah, we'll confirm that it is a pure natural or the adulterated one? I mean, there are several ways to do it. The simple one, the low cost one that you can do it. You can look always, it doesn't matter how much they purify, especially in dietary supplement. I mean, you remember a lot of many drugs have been recorded right now because of contamination of uh, solvent or the chemical residue. So if you analyze it, synthetic one versus the natural one, you can always look at the profile. We have recently published a paper where we have tracked down all the components in the synthetic pathway that was present in the product. So there is a one way to do it, or you can do the carbon 13, which has been published recently for curcuma case that uh, they can do the carbon 13 and find out whether it has been synthetically done or natural one. There's a lot, lot of ways to do it. Uh, it's not a routine analysis that you, everybody can do in the lab, but you can do that technique or you can look at the impurities. As I said, in order to keep the cost down, they will never gonna clean you 100% the synthetic and if you analyze it you always find some impurities there that you can say is a synthetic origin or natural origin you have to be creative i mean it, that's required a lot of tools needs to develop uh, it, in fact if you're looking for adulteration and quality uh, this is to me is a most of a forensic science you are doing it uh, it's not about quality anymore you have to look at what else might be there and what caused it and why this compound is coming here Working with FDA, I mean, we certainly have to be 100% sure because <clears throat> as I told you, we end up generally being a part of the witness or expert in the court cases. So our analysis, our manuscripts are being read more by the lawyers than is being read by the scientists and public. So they, they take it apart. So we have to be very careful and 100% sure what we are saying is right. So it requires a lot more work, just simple analysis, but you can do it. Thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Khan, there was another um, question that actually has to deal with the safety of CBD oils, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, buying and using, and then is it is it possible later to test positive for drugs in your system? Okay, so there one thing is, if you are using CBD oil, I assume you are take, taking as a drop or capsule you are not putting, if you are rubbing it, that's, it can also go in your body. Uh, it really depends. There is a debate out there that CBD might be converting into THC, but there's still no evidence whatsoever. But I will say if you are taking the huge amount of it, chances are your oil that you are taking does have a small amount of THC in it. It also depends is coming from synthetic sources or is coming from natural sources. As you know, the USDA guidelines allow you to have <clears throat> less than 0.3%. So 
So 0.3% TAC, if it is less than 0.3% in your final product, uh, then you are fine. You can have that one. So if you take a huge amount of it, and even it's allowed legally, you are still gonna have some amount in the TAC in your body system. But, so, but this is not the right way if you're looking for TAC. If you are taking one or two capsules, the chances are it might not have any CBD in it, honestly speaking. It might be some, something else which is not gonna hurt you. Uh, it might be very small amount of CBD oil. It might be hemp seed oil, which is already allowed, which has a very little amount of CBD. All the CBD products are not equal. As I showed you the example of dietary supplements, CBD is out there is more problem that we have seen it. Uh, but I don't think it will become all the TA CBD will convert into THC and you will turn positive. Uh, I will say it certainly depend on the amount and the CBD product you are taking, how much it has initially. I hope it answers your question. Thank you. The uh, next question I have came through chat was uh, in regard to dietary supplements, is there anything that we could do to build our immune system to help fight colds and viruses? Yes, so this is, we showed you the spirulina one. The immune system is, is a complex system. Even we do in vitro analysis, it shows some parameters we can look into leukine, this and that, but how it translates to human. And to me, giving a lot of thoughts and listing what's going on with the COVID, you can see how many types of immune system out there because the way people are responding to COVID. So co immune system in itself is very complex. Uh, it's, it, to be, it's a defense system in your body that it can trigger from different ways. Stress is one of them that they say, if you have a stress, it is gonna make you weak. Uh, taking a supplement, again, if supplement that generally are known to make you feel good, provide you immunity like we have a spirulina here. There are some mushroom diets, you can take it. Uh, there are several herbs that has been put into uh, boost your immune system, adaptogenic like uh, ginseng, uh, in moderation, uh, boosting your immune system is totally individual. It's not something that is gonna work for me, it might work for you. We are talking about microbiome being involved in it. We are talking about diet involved in it. Environment is also causing uh, stress and immune system. But there are some things you can have, like people talk about taking a chicken soup is gonna help you, so polysaccharides. So there are mushroom, shiatki mushroom is there. You can take the spirulina is being sold by Chromodex. I'm not endorsing it, but this is directly what we are proving the point that is not a single molecule is gonna go across your blood brain barrier rather than it's, it's just provided immunity through your gut. And so there are products out there which can help you, but again, you have to decide what product you're looking for. Uh, but immune is a very complex for individual, plus the way people respond to it, it might not work for everybody. There's not really one drug you can call it. And as I said, it COVID is, attacking people and everybody's response in, in so many different ways that you can't even grasp it, what COVID is doing and what the immune system is doing. But protecting your immune system, uh, I think is a good thing. Whatever you can do it, less stress, environment, taking supplement with your diet, taking some, have a herbal diet. Not everything has to be capsule. That's one of the thing is changing right now. Uh, if you travel in traditional, countries like India and China, especially China, uh, they serve you a soup, which are all the ingredients are all the herbal products that you will see in the capsule. Uh, you can buy, have a cup of soup, which is have ginseng and mushrooms and everything else in it. And that, that can be used as a soup and boost your immune system. Uh, so that's again, you are looking at the diet. Uh, generally the tendency is here in US uh, is it has to be put into capsule, which is easier to swallow. Uh, I don't think that we have to go for that one. I mean, especially that COVID is forcing us to rethink our 
way of life. And uh, one of the thing is probably we have to think about our nutrition and diet, how to change it in a way that we rely less on capsules and uh, have our whole health as a whole uh, immune system and the environment is more healthy environment and more preventing more attacks, which is gonna come again and again. COVID is not, not the last one, uh, but the way things are going, I mean, we have MRS, antibacterial, we just get high on one thing and forget about, uh, you remember MRSA and uh, that infectious diseases are going to up, going up and we have to look for infection and how to protect our immune system. Thank you so much. And that um, those are all of the questions that I have in the chat. Uh, does anyone have any other questions before we wrap up? Well, if not, um, I thank you all for uh, attending today. Uh, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for your time. Thank this you, was a wonderful you. talk. And all, the, all the alumni, you are we are proud of you and uh, we are here. If you have any question later on, you can send me an email or come and visit us. Uh, not right now, but when things open, but virtually it's a nice facility. If you have graduated from Fraser Hall, you certainly would like to come and see how we have expanded the facility uh, in Fraser Hall, plus also surrounding, we have the phase one, phase two building. Uh, so we love to hear from you. And if you have any question in that, area or anything about natural product, uh, you are welcome to ask and visit us. Thank you very much for your attention. And Scott, thanks very much for the opportunity. Absolutely. And, and you're, you're very kind to uh, give us your time. I know that even though things are different, you're, you're uh, still as busy, if not more busy, uh, based on uh, how things have changed uh, on the university's campus. So um, I've had a question about a link to the recording. Uh, yes, we, we did record this today. It will be housed on the Alumni Association's website. Uh, might be possible that we can email um, all of our attendees uh, uh, a, a link to the recording as well. So uh, yes, we will be um, sharing this. Uh, and Sarah tells us that uh, we, we will um, be happy to email the link. Um, so we uh, have more of these coming up. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of many that we've done so far, and, and we plan to do even more. Uh, you can go to OleMissAlumni.com to see any of our future upfront events. There are, um, there are a couple that are listed now. I have a couple others that are not listed yet, but I'm working on. I know next uh, month, uh, Chris Green from our School of Law is going to be talking about um, the, uh, the Ole Miss Law School and its direct um, impact on or its direct uh, uh, work with vetting of the nominee for the Supreme Court. Uh, so that'll be a very interesting one as well. So be on the lookout on our website. Uh, we'll have those events listed. We'll also have the links to the ones that we've already done. And um, uh, we will um, wrap it up with this. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your week. And uh, you can uh, get in touch with the alumni office if you have further questions on this or any of the other uh, events that we've done. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>